What's your thoughts about the law of attraction on how to apply it the right way or? Yeah, I think, well, I think the law of attraction and manifesting are the same thing. Mm -hmm. So law of attraction for everybody who has not read the secret is simply your thoughts become things. Mm -hmm. And it's true. We've talked all about how when you have a negative self-talk, it tends to draw more of that to you. I think about it like lint in a dryer. Once negative stuff starts to collecting, it oh. collects a lot more. We can also talk about your brain filter or something called the reticular activity system and how it is a live network that filters the brain. We'll dig into that deeper, but let's do surface level right now, manifesting law of attraction. So here's what everybody gets wrong about manifesting. Everybody, at least kind of in the mass market, what you're trained to think about when you think about manifesting is vision boards. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the word vision boards, you think about the big stuff. Should you have big dreams? Of course you should. Should you dream of building a mansion on the ocean if that's your thing? Yes. Should you dream of the <laughs> log cabin? Yes. If you want a Lamborghini or the new Ford Bronco, should you put, yeah, yes, yes, yes. If you want the family, if you want the body, should you think about, yeah, absolutely. Here's where everybody goes wrong. You dream about the end. You make this gorgeous collage of all this stuff that has nothing to do with your current life. <laughs> That literally, as you're sitting in your studio apartment with the cat box that hasn't been <laughs> changed in two weeks. No food in the fridge. No yeah. food in the fridge. And you're looking for a job and you're staring at a mansion going, someday, <laughs> it's going to make you feel like a loser. Yeah. Because the gap between where you are and where you want to go it seems insurmountable. And so what happens, based on the research, is when you only visualize the end game, Lewis, it's demotivating. Mm. At first, it's really fun to like have a bottle of wine and make your like collage. I'm gonna visualize, I'm gonna slap this up. There's my vision board, it's fabulous. Law of attraction, baby, come on. I'm gonna think about it, it's gonna come to me. Okay, I've been doing this for two days. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm still in this apartment with the cat box that needs to be changed. The way to visualize properly is to visualize the bridge between where you are and where you need to go. The bridge. Yes, and particularly the horrible stuff. Mm. So let's use your example of the marathon. The vision board would be Lewis crossing. <laughs> the arms up the yeah, metal. the arms up the yes. metal, exactly. The high fives, high yeah, fives. I did it. Yes, I did it, exactly. That will not help you. Because when you hit mile 13 on the actual race and it is sleeting rain. You're saying, why am I doing this? Yes, and it feels nothing like that thing on your vision board. You're going to start a negative dialogue. I can't do this, my knees hurt. This is not what I thought it was gonna be. I'm not ready for this. I didn't train for this. I'm running New York, I trained in LA. Are you mm -hmm. running in New York? LA. Okay, good. Well then at least you trained in the right weather. Yeah, yeah. So on and on and on, and you are going to tank yourself. What you do by visualizing the bridge is you train your nervous system and your mind to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. So you should visualize not crossing the finish line, but what is it like to be at mile 12 when your batteries run out on your earbuds? Yeah. No, oh, I'm serious. Yeah. And you keep going. What's it like when your shoelace breaks and mm -hmm. now your heel is lifting and you're starting to get a blood blister at mile mm -hmm. 17? Mm -hmm. What's it feel like? when you wake up and it is pouring rain and you visualize yourself running anyway. That way, when you visualize the work, you are preparing your body for it so you're not resistant to it when it comes. Yeah, Isn't that cool? I think it's great. It's um, a story that I had, um, George St. Pierre, who's one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time, he said that he always puts himself in the most uncomfortable situations in practice leading up to the fight. The most, you know, the hardest situations to get himself out of. When his arms are behind his back and he's faced against the, the mat and in between the fence and he's just getting punched in the face, he's like, how do I get out of this? Right, right. He's like, visualize that and seeing how can I get through this? Yeah, yeah, when exactly. It seems, when it seems like I just want to tap out. Yes. Instead of tapping out, what's the process for figuring out how to get through it? Yeah. To then raise my hand at the end victorious. Totally. And so you are literally building up almost like this resilience and this muscle inside of you to do the work to get the thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, create the vision board, but make sure in addition to crossing the finish line, you have somebody running in the rain. Right. You have somebody who, you have an alarm clock that says 513. You have, you know, these images 
that show the mm. stuff that you don't want to do. So like for people who want to launch a business, for example, like a lot of people that I'm sure follow both of us are dying to launch a business or interested in being an influencer, social media or making money online. And what you visualize are the checks or you visualize the money you're going to make or you visualize how cool it's going to be when you're a lifestyle entrepreneur or whatever mm. the hell it is. Don't do that. Visualize working a day job and telling your friends that you're not gonna go out tonight because you're right. working on something. Yeah. Visualize making cold calls and being told no. Visualize not going to that party because you're staying in on a Saturday and not going to the barbecue because you're putting in the work. Yeah. Visualize sitting at a seminar and learning from other people. Visualize watching YouTube videos. Visualize your first ever course failing miserably. Right. Like, literally, that's the sort of thing that you want to visualize yourself doing and pushing through because that's gonna help you do the work. Yeah. Isn't that cool? I think that's great. Yeah, yeah, visualizing. So in order to manifest what you want, don't just visualize the good things happening, visualize the bridge, all the things it's gonna to take to get yes. there. Yes, and, and, and the hard parts of the bridge, because then you're ready for it. Mm -hmm. Then you're like, I didn't expect this to be this hard. I mean, it's still gonna be right. hard, Right. but you're less likely to quit. Yes. So what have you done in the last five years to help you manifest after the first book? Were you doing this as well? Or kind of once you get on a rhythm and, and build momentum, does it become easier to manifest in your opinion? Well, so I am constantly training my mind to work for me. And there's this little trick that I talk about in the book that is all sort of the beginning of having a high five attitude. And mm -hmm. a high five attitude is the ability to catch yourself when you're going mentally low and to flip yourself back up into a high five attitude. Okay. The thing that I know to be true is that you cannot control the things around you. You can't control what's going to happen. You can't even control how your nervous system might respond or what thoughts might pop into your head. But you can always choose what you do next and what you make it mean, right? And so that's where mm -hmm. all the power is. Yes. And so I uh, do this thing where I, this is again, it's going to sound so dumb but it's a way for me to introduce you to the power that your mind has to change in real time okay we've talked a lot about negative self-talk and part of the reason why negative self-talk is so crippling is not only because you've repeated it for so long and now it's a pattern but it's also because you have a filter on your brain called the reticular activity system mm -hmm. okay this puppy is the keys to everything <sighs> And, and it's remarkable that uh, most of us have never heard of it, we've experienced it, but we don't know how to use it to our advantage. Mm -hmm. So first let me tell you what the RAS does, then I'm gonna give you an example of uh, when you've experienced it in your life, and then I'm going to explain to you how to use it to get what you want in life. This okay. is like the Perfect. super attractor manifesting and it also works for, um, interrupting negative self-talk, like it's going to supercharge all the work you're doing with the mirror and interrupting thoughts. So first let's talk about the RES. So the RES, imagine a hairnet on your brain, only it's like electric, meaning it's alive, okay? Now the RES has one job, and the job is block out 99% of what's going on and let in 1% of what's going on. Our brains at this moment in history are having to process about 34 days mm. worth of cell phone data in one day. Crazy. It's crazy. And so your RAS has a monster job. It's like a bouncer at a bar. Mm -hmm. You're not coming in, you can come in. And you've experienced this. So have you ever shopped for a car? Yes. Okay, so what's the last car you bought? Tesla. Oh, Tesla. Oh, fancy. Yeah, Lewis yeah. House, I like that. Well, I never had a, I never had a nice car until three years ago. I had a $4,000 car for five years before that. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, you know what? I have no Bluetooth, I have no, it's like, I just needed yeah. an upgrade. Yeah, no, I love it. It was you a 1991. It. Dude, you deserve it. I had a 1991 Cadillac, you it. and I was like, okay, you deserve buy it. a car. So I bought a Tesla, yeah. Right, and so before you thought about buying a Tesla, you drive down the road, you don't really think about it. The second uh -huh. you're like, you know, I think I'm interested in a Tesla, what do you see everywhere? Teslas. Yes, everywhere. Uh, everywhere. My husband just bought a pickup truck. I never even noticed them. Now I'm like, there are baby blue pickup trucks everywhere. <laughs> what is going on? That's the bouncer in your brain. Uh -huh. And let me tell you how this works. There are only four things that automatically get through the bouncer in your brain, the RAS. Number one, your name. 
So you've experienced being in a crowded place and somebody's like, you think you hear Lewis and you're like, huh, somebody call my name? That was the bouncer in your brain. The second thing that always gets let in is any threat to your safety. So there are loud noises all over the, all the time, but only ones in close proximity make you go like this. Mm -hmm. That was the bouncer in your brain letting it in. Okay. The third thing that gets let in is when you sense that your partner is interested in sex with you or somebody else. You're like, Chris, you know, <laughs> who are you looking? Stop looking at her. You know what I'm saying? You kind of pick up on the signals. That's the bouncer in your brain. And the fourth one, and this is where, this is the billion dollar thing that everybody needs to know. The bouncer in your brain lets in whatever you think is important to you. Mm. So when you get intentional about telling your brain what's important to you, like I'm interested in a Tesla, your brain's literally like, oh, let's all, let all the Teslas in, come on in. Here's the downside to this. If you have told yourself that you are a bad person for the last 10 years, guess what your brain thinks is important? Mm. Examples that mean you're a bad person. Right. So I'm gonna give you a very specific example. So I personally don't think I'm a bad person. I don't think I'm perfect, right. but I know I do my best. I mean well, I don't have that story about myself mm -hmm. at all. I used to, but I don't. And um, let's say I oversleep and I miss the dentist. I miss the dentist appointment, I'm like, oh, I gotta pay the 25 bucks. I gotta reschedule that thing, that kind of blows. That's all I think, and then I go on. In my daughter, who constantly beats herself up and says she's a bad person, this is a real example, by the way, she oversleeps, misses a dentist appointment, and it becomes, see, I always screw everything up. Uh -huh. I'm a terror, I, I, I'm always messing things up. I'm a bad, like everything that gets let in confirms that you're right, right. a bad person. She finds proof and evidence. Yes, yeah. that's the bouncer in your mind. I'm here to tell you that when you get intentional about what you want to think about yourself, it changes in mm. real time what your brain lets in and what it doesn't. Yeah. That helps you with the other things that you're doing. The high five in the mirror, yes. the I'm not thinking about that, the pathetic mantra. Hey, you know, just because I missed the dentist appointment doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Yeah. I'm doing the best I can here. Give myself a break. Right. High five. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Shake it off. Get back in there. Um, <laughs> It, well, it's true, right? Right. Because it's these little things. Somebody cuts you off. Somebody reaches for the last thing of cereal that you wanted to buy at the grocery mm -hmm. store. You think it's like a sign that the world's out to get you. This is all your story and your mind skewing the world to prove all of the stuff you keep repeating. And the only way to get a handle on it is to start acting the opposite. Like high five yourself, even though you don't feel like it. Interrupt the crap that you keep saying. Put your hands on your heart and settle your body down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of these things are things that somebody does when they care about themselves. When they think they deserve to be treated with kindness. Yes. When they think they deserve support. And when they realize they need it. And when you start to build yourself back up, you'll show up very differently in other relationships. Absolutely. You know, if you tolerate this kind of treatment from yourself, you'll tolerate it from other people. Mm -hmm. It does begin with you. And when you create boundaries and you don't abandon yourself, then you won't abandon yourself with other people either. You Correct. won't let them cross the boundaries. Correct. Like if you stand in front of the mirror every single morning and you're like, I look like crap. I am not good enough. I'm unhappy with my life. And then you step into a relationship and somebody leaves you on red and they ghost you for three days, like you come to expect that because that's how you believe you think you deserve to be treated. When you stand in front of a mirror yeah. and you're like, hey, you're awesome. We got this, I got you. I know it's hard, you know, we're gonna go do this. Or, hey, this is a big day today. I, I've got this huge presentation. I am going to destroy this. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. you know, like you get into it, you're excited. Like then you're creating momentum. Mm -hmm for yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, what, you're gonna stand there and be like, oh my God, I screwed this up, I'm not prepared. Da, 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 da. Like it's, it's like the negative morning routine. Mm -hmm. right. It leads to negative actions. Absolutely. So this training thing, training your RES. So here's mm -hmm. what I want you to do. Starting tomorrow, after you wake up and make your bed and kind of settle your nervous system and high five yourself after setting your intention. So now you're like sending yourself into your morning routine in a totally different way 
with a calm down nervous system, an intention, and this boost of feeling supported and loved and celebrated, um, I want you to find one naturally occurring heart shape as you go through your day. Mm, I saw could, this in your book. Yeah. yeah, it could be a stone. It could be a leaf on the ground. It could be a cloud shape. It could be a coffee stain. Uh, it could be an oil stain on the floor of a garage. It could be a spot on a dog walking by. I want you to tell your mind, let's find a heart. Let's see if we can find a heart. And something weird's going to happen. You're going to see something. And then I want you to literally supersize what's going on in your brain. And what you do is when you see the heart, I want you to then take a moment and literally congratulate yourself, like feel like, oh my God, I found it. Like whatever you believe in God, the universe, like greater connection, you put that there for me and I found it. Mm. And I want you to feel this kind of wave of, that's kind of cool. Yeah. I just saw a heart. And then that positive thing, remember how I told you, the bouncer in your brain pays attention to what's important to you. Mm -hmm. When you get your nervous system celebratory involved, that makes your brain really pay attention. Just like trauma makes your brain pay attention. It does. So you supercharge the experience by celebrating it and then look for another one around. I see hearts all day long. Yeah. And what happens when you start to play this game is you will start to realize you are walking by an entirely different world every single day because you're not looking for it. Mm -hmm. There are opportunities, there are signs, there are mile markers on your path that you are literally tuning out. Yes. And we can all sit in this moment, Lewis, and look back and see how the dots of our life connect us here. The coolest thing about practicing the high five habit, this training of finding hearts and the high five attitude, is that you start to ground yourself in the idea that this too is a dot on the map of your life and it is leading you somewhere incredible. Mm -hmm. And when you start to have that kind of high five attitude, that there are signs, whether it's the little hearts that you're now seeing or it's your ability to catch guilt or people pleasing or insecurity or the negative self-talk and be like, nope, not going down, not thinking about that, five, four, three, two, one. Let's get that high five attitude back. I can, I can do this. I, I can have my own back. It's not yeah. going to be perfect, but I can keep going. And you were just talking about how you never truly learned how to love yourself in your own skin. And you started this daily ritual, this habit of high-fiving yourself in the mirror. Yeah. How, I mean, you're, you've, lived a, you've lived a pretty full life right now, but you feel like really you've never truly learned how to love yourself, but now you feel like you know how to? Yes. I do. Why did you not know how to love yourself in the first place? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I think that most of us are not taught how to love ourselves just for being alive. For existing. For existing. Thank you. It's always like we have to accomplish something. Correct. Then we can get love. Yes. It's, it's the same thing with happiness. Like you're chasing it and you think that if you achieve something, you're going to get it. And you also, or at least I felt the most loved when I was little, when I was achieving something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that most parents kind of fall into this camp. And it's really interesting to write a book about this and sort of trace back how we go from being little teeny babies that would crawl up to a mirror and put our hands up and kiss ourselves and love the sight of ourselves to being a self-loathing adult that stands in front of a mirror and either ignores or criticizes your yeah. very existence. And... I believe that a lot of this has to do with the fact that so much of what you learn <clears throat> as a kid is if you do what I tell you to do, then I'll like you, then I'll love you. And so much of your existence becomes complying, fitting in, not making people angry. You learn how to sort of go in and out of spaces, belong to groups, make mm -hmm. sure people like you, and you stop focusing on how you were born, which is looking in a mirror and liking yourself. So my formula mm. for being somebody that was worthy of love is, well, if I'm accomplishing all this stuff, then I'm lovable. If this person over here that I love loves me back, then I'm lovable. Mm. If somebody likes me, then I'm lovable. Notice where all the sources of love were coming from? Outside. Mm. But I never really understood 
How do you learn how to put yourself first? How do you learn how to love yourself, Lewis? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. We know we need to, but the question is how? I'm on a mission to make every human being realize that if you wake up in the morning and you're breathing and you're standing in front of that mirror, you not only deserve a high five, you need it mm. because